Eugenia is a professor of creative writing in the master's program at Fairfield University. Apparently, she brought her peeps. She's also the author of the award-winning novel, The Calligrapher's Daughter, which I'm really excited to go out and read. Um, her story, her novel, is inspired by real events from her life. Um, one of the true stories that happened right after her parents' wedding, for example. The day after they were married, her father traveled to the United States to study theology. And he thought it might take a couple of weeks for his bride to join him. But the papers never got cleared, and she couldn't follow him to study medicine at Goucher College, which was her intent. At the time, tensions between Japan and, and uh, China were mounting, and the Japanese closed down ports. So she was sort of stuck. Eugenia's mother was told to study at Tokyo University instead. And they remained separated because of the war in China and then, of course, World War II. After Pearl Harbor, they lost touch entirely. If this were a movie, you would then cut to wartime America. And Eugenia's father, who had fluency in English, Japanese, and China, got a job with the government. And when the war ended, intent on finding his wife, he traveled back as a translator to Korea with General Hodge. And thanks to a mi mix of rare coincidence and perseverance, of course, and irony and prayer, the newlyweds were reunited nine years later. Because her father had been an American field officer, they were able to visit the US in 1948 with their babies in tow. Can you imagine? 1948, think about Korean history. They intended to stay, you know, a couple years so that Eugenia's mom could learn English and finally attend college in the US, but more babies and the Korean War prevented their return to Korea. But so it was that Eugenia, the last of the Kim family's six children, was born in the United States, in White Plains, New York, in fact. And not unlike many of the American-born generation, she struggled with her Korean-American identity. I don't know if you are familiar with that concept. It wasn't until a half century into her life that she actively confronted it. What took her so long? What was it that made a difference? As she neared her hungup? Well, here's Professor Kim to let you know. The advantage of being the youngest of six children in a Korean American family is that you are sort of live your life under the radar. The, disadvantage is that you live your life under the radar and your parents sort of don't know who you are. So, <laughs> so I, was, I, was, I grew up very American, as sort of you can tell, actually, maybe even Italian <laughs> by the way I use my hands. But um, being the last of six, among those advantages that I had was to hear the stories of my family's lives, not only from my parents themselves, but also through all of my five older siblings. And the story I'm gonna tell you tonight is a true story, and it's kind of a ghost story. So maybe the sun will set by the time the story's over. So being, um, um, among eight children, we, we moved to Washington in, in the early 50s, and there were eight people living in a two-bedroom house. So I slept in my be parents' bedroom. Now, okay, so, yes, I was their birth control, yes. <laughs> but the reason why I'm telling you about the sleeping conditions in my parents' house was because I witnessed what happened when my mother dreamed, and she dreamed often and significantly. And later, as I grew, she would tell me the stories about her dreams. Among the most significant dreams that she had was when she was pregnant four months with every child. So one time she dreamt she was walking in sort of a desert woods, and a snake fell down from a tree and wrapped itself around her. And she woke up screaming, and she knew that she would have a boy. I mean, come on, snake, come on. <laughs> but with each girl, because she had one boy and five girls, with each girl, she dreamt she was in water. Water was always a part of the element of her dreams for her girls. 
So one of them, she dreamt that she was by the river and she found a gorgeous stone, a white stone perfectly formed for doing laundry. Right? No one is excited about that but my mother. <laughs> and she knew she was having a girl and that was my sister Gloria. For me, she dreamt she was standing in a brook and trying to catch this little silver fish that was very active and what was elusive, and so finally she caught this fish and she held it up into the water. She was so happy, she was laughing. She woke up laughing, and she turned to her husband, and her husband was laughing as well because he had had the very same dream. So she knew from her dream, so she had always told us these stories, and I knew that my mother had significant powers in her dreams. In that same bedroom that I shared with my parents as their birth control, <laughs> <laughs> was a portrait of my grandfather. It was a photographic portrait taken in his later years. So my Harabaji. So he had, he was always a traditional man. He had uh, lived through the occupation. He had survived it. He was Yangban, so an aristocrat who had always been a scholar and an artist. And so he had the traditional white goatee. He had the laurel of white hair around his head. His face was not smiling, and partly I learned that it was because uh, when you take a, a photograph as a traditional person, you don't smile. It's not, a, it's not a occasion to celebrate, it's a solemn occasion. So he was not smiling, but in the corners of his eyes, you could see a little bit of warmth. Being in that room, trying to fall asleep, I studied that portrait often. So my Harabaji, who lived in Seoul, with uh, my mother's only brother, this is my maternal grandfather. He died in May, early 1960s, when I was about 10. And it didn't really affect me because I had never experienced death before. And he was a, a Korean you know, elder who I had heard a lot about but hadn't really known. Until one day, I saw my mother sitting at the kitchen table with a bunch of photographs, crying. And I tried to look at the photographs, but she shuffled them up and put them in her apron pocket. And so, you know, I kind of was like at the kitchen door, what's wrong? She's, Nothing, she just put them away. So I just bided my time. You know, my mother spoke mostly Korean and I spoke mostly English, so our conversation were like this. But I also knew that no matter where she put those photos, in that two bedroom house, few hiding places, I would be able to find those photos one day. And sure enough, about two months later, I found them in her sewing cabinet drawer. I had sort of forgotten about them then. So I took them to the woods, you know, I'm 10 years old, in a hiding place I had found, and I looked at them, and I had never experienced death before, so I'm looking at these black and white photos with little crinkled edges, and they're actual photos of the burial, and they're very graphic. And they are pictures of my Harabaji being lowered into the grave in a cloth-covered coffin tied with ropes that they used to sort of handle the coffin. And I was really shocked. And for the first time, I thought about my mother. I thought about, what if that was my father? How would I feel about that? And so even though I was not close to my mother, I began to think of her as something other than my mother. You know, she was a person who had lost her father. So I like to think that maybe I was kind to her for the next few days, but I kind of doubt it. And then my mother started having dreams. So this goes back to the bedroom, the reason why I'm telling you about the bedroom. She started having dreams, and they were, she would wake up screaming. Well, when you're dreaming and you're screaming, it really comes out like this horrible moan. So although I had heard her dream and moan many times, it was every night, every night she was dreaming. And she was so disturbed by this dream because it was every night. This is the now, what I'm gonna tell you now happened, or is information I learned later. She was so disturbed by this dream that she wrote to her brother, my uncle, about it in Seoul. The one thing my grandfather had asked for when he was buried was to be buried in a dry place. So what she was dreaming was that he was sitting up in that coffin and he would be dripping wet. Water was pouring from his hair through his beard 
and he would raise his arms and water would pour out from his Rami sleeves, his burial gown, and it was plaintive and he would say nothing, but the water would be mixed with his tears. She was so disturbed by this dream because it would happen every night that after a couple of months towards the end of the summer, she wrote to her brother in Korea to say, go and look at the gravesite to see what is going on. In that time, you know, airmail to Korea was took six, seven days. She got a letter back in three days. And so she figured, oh, he hasn't got my letter yet. This is going to be the same old sentimental, you know, stuff that he always writes. But he told her that he was having a dream about seeing grandfather Harabaji sitting up in his grave, dripping wet. So what could you do? Nothing. 1960s, early 90s, they were an immigrant struggling family. Nothing to be done. He said in his letter, I went to the gravesite to be sure that there was no water nearby. And there was no water. He went with the cemetery director. There was nothing nearby. The grave was, you know, the grass was growing. It was beautiful. It was a beautiful, peaceful site. So that was it. A year and a half later, my grandmother died, and they would be buried together. So as they began to dig the grave, they sent a telegram to my uncle saying, you must come, you must come right away. And he did. And as they were digging the grave, it was full of mud. So he telephoned my mother. And in, the, in those days, telephone call was you know, $60. And uh, it, they were, it was done by radio through Japan. So it was very expensive, $35 a minute, which is like $600 a minute now. So he called my mother and said, what should I do? They found mud in the grave. And they agreed that no matter what it cost, they should exhume grandfather. So my uncle made the order to exhume grandfather. And it took 12 men, eight extra men, to lift that coffin out of the grave. And there was a suction of mud as they lifted him out and put him on planks so that he could dry in the sun. They drilled holes in the bottom all around his coffin, and water arced out. He had been buried in an underground stream. They moved his grave to a higher spot on the mountain and buried my grandmother with him. So this is a story that always stayed with me and I never understood what it meant. What does this, what does, why is this story so compelling to me besides its mystical aspects? It did reinforce to me that my mother had incredible power and grace in her Korean culture, in her Korean heritage. But it also made me wonder, was it a story built from guilt because she was not close to her father in the way that I was not close to my mother? And the more I thought about it, in my 50s, I began to think, well, maybe I should write it down as a way to understand what the story is. And the more I wrote, the more I realized that I didn't know anything about Korea, really. So I began to research. I began to research both the, t the period that my grandparents lived in, the period that my mother lived in. My mother lived in, she was born in 1910 and lived her entire life in the Japanese occupation. And the more I learned, the more I began to understand that it wasn't just that dream that made the difference. It was the story that she told me about her heritage, about what she knew, about her culture, that made me able to accept being Korean American. So that is my Korean American story. Thank you. Thank you.